situation around two major challenges. Recurring inflationary episodes and recurring financial crisis and how to grapple with those issues. And central bank independence and the mandates are institutions that are directed at meeting those challenges. So as Beatrice reminded us in this morning, in the 1990s uh, there was a wave of institutional reforms uh, in high income economies when they adopted inflation targeting and were backed up by more legal uh, legislated independence. So this concerns the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, Bank of Canada, um, the Riks Bank, the Bank of England, plus ECB around the newly formed euro. And arguably, these reforms had their roots in the challenges of the 70s and 80s, high inflation spurred on by large supply shocks and sustained by high inflationary expectations. So, a first question for the panel, which were the main concerns behind the 1990s wave of central bank reforms in terms of practical policy experience and perhaps also academic thinking? And how much did these concerns reflect specific challenges of the 70s and 80s or more uh, germane issues? Then we saw a downturn of inflation, and to many that looked like a major success, tolerable losses of output and employment. So the main policy challenges in the next few decades were instead to be about financial crises, how to recuperate from the great financial crisis, and how to stave off new ones, not least uh, at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we got to see new financial regulation, QE, unconventional uh, central bank intervention, and policy rates at record lows for a long time. So a second question for the panel then is, which new concerns were raised by the events and challenges in the uh, 2000s and the 2010s in handling financial crisis and deflationary pressures? And in particular, do these challenges suggest new trade-offs? for example, between monetary and fiscal policy, or between present macroeconomic outcomes and future financial stability. So if you look at today, superficially, the situation looks like a 70s, 80s redux with major supply shocks and uh, emerging inflation inertia. Uh, so this brings us, I guess, to the most important and the bottom line question. Given the concerns behind the 1990s reform and the challenges in the next few decades, should we rethink bank, central bank independence and central bank mandates? That is, are there good ideas or even concre concrete proposals for new reforms of central banking rules? Okay, so finally the plan for the session. So we'll spend the next 20 minutes on initial remarks by each panelist. Then we'll have a discussion within the panel around these initial remarks for maybe another 15 minutes. And after that, we'll turn to a round of Q&A involving the audience. So think about questions and please think about succinct questions rather than statements beforehand and relate, try to relate them to the three major uh, questions that I outlined. And in the last five minutes, panelists will be able to make some final remarks. Okay, so now let's go to the initial remarks, at most five minutes for, for each of you. Uh, I'm sure the re these remarks will span many aspects of the broad panel theme, but by agreement, each panelist will put more emphasis on one of the three main questions that I outlined. So Ken and Mervyn will touch on question number one, uh, Claudia on question number two, and uh, Jay on question three. So without further ado, please, Ken Rogoff. Well, first of all, thank you very much to the organizers, to the Rex Bank, for inviting me to speak. Um, as I think you've heard so many remarks about Stefan. I can just summarize them by in the central banking community, he is regarded as a guru, that you don't know the answer, some hard question. He's a person you really can go to and get you know, a very deep 
uh, answer to, and uh, we'll hear more about that as things go on. Uh, I've been asked to talk about uh, some of the early developments, more of the question one uh, that we've had here. Um, and uh, I think the academic literature uh, on this started uh, in, the, in the 1980s. But of course, you know, really it goes back among pr practitioners far earlier than that. But I'd say an especially important event was the Fed Treasury Accord in 1951 that set up the Fed to be an independent central bank back in the 1980s. That was a rarity uh, still. Uh, the Bundesbank had achieved that, but most countries had not. Um, my own contribution uh, was to uh, develop a theoretical model uh, that would try to address how it would work, why it would work, and it was an answer to a very abstract question posed by Kidland and Prescott and Barrow and Gordon about why you might get stuck in high inflation and what you might want to do about it. Um, and uh, uh, my, my paper looked at uh, various ideas, including using an inflation target, uh, appointing uh, people who were had already had a reputation for having a strong anti-inflation commitment. and. Needless to say, I was very inspired by the great Paul Volcker, who uh, I was working below, very, very far below, but I was working below Paul Volcker uh, at the time when I was working on that. And there's been uh, just tremendous amount of literature uh, since taking this to many places. Um, I think you're all familiar with Europe, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, but I wanted to just really uh, emphasize a, an area people don't think about as much, which are emerging markets. And Tobias Adrian really spoke about this, but I still think most people don't quite understand uh, about the efficacy of the concept about how uh, important it is. I, um, Europe, uh, European emerging markets, uh, if you looked in 1992, there were 40 countries with inflation over 40%. And that doesn't even capture things because a lot of them had hyperinflations at the time. Uh, and the, to get out of it, the early solution that tr was tried in many places for a long time was, well, the dollar's really good, or uh, let's fix our exchange rate against the dollar. And that was uh, very good for those of us that want to study financial crises, uh, but on the whole didn't work so well. Um, and uh, there was really this period of transformation where some very bold emerging market uh, central bankers got the idea, you know, it worked in advanced countries, let's do it here. And I would I, th I think there are many, but I would single out Arminio Fraga in Brazil, Guillermo Ortiz in Mexico, for example. And I think people forget, but they, when they were trying this, people thought, this is ridiculous. You know, you can't be independent in these countries with these weak institutions. And the IMF also over time really played a very uh, positive role here in pushing the idea. By 2015, uh, inflation was actually very low across the world. It's not today, but uh, even in places it seemed unimaginable, uh, not just uh, you know, the f uh, former Soviet republics, uh, African countries uh, with inflation under 10%, even under uh, 5%. Uh, and indeed, many people have forgotten you know, that central bank independence w uh, was ever needed. I invite them to read about Turkey, uh, for example, where the uh, president has fired central bankers the way Henry VIII changed wives. And you can see what's resulted there. Uh, I would say there are many refinements once you have an independent central bank of how to do it and uh, literature to which many people in this room have contributed. Uh, but I think the independence of the central bank is at the absolute central uh, starting point to this. If you look at many of the, these emerging markets, they weren't really doing inflation targeting. They aren't really still doing inflation targeting, but they've used this as a device to establish their independence. Now, just to sort of summarize, um, I would also say there are so many things 
I, I didn't expect, and I'd just single out one. I'm surprised the extent to which central banks in, in everywhere almost are regarded as honest brokers. I mean, if you want to know what the data is, you go ask the central bank. And I think that's also uh, part of this uh, com uh, coming from independence. I think another thing which uh, people in this room are very familiar with, but I, I think it's been very important, is the community of central bankers helping to support each other, exchanging ideas, and there's been a huge networking effect in this, in providing ideas and also support. When the whole central banking community stands behind you a little bit, your government listens. And I think we can uh, point at uh, many examples of that. Um, and then, you know, uh, certainly recently, uh, the central bank independence has been under attack. I certainly don't think it's an idea, you know, which is over at all. I, I would actually argue that the uh, in introduction of central bank independence has been the most significant positive development in macroeconomic policy since the Second World War. Thank you. Well, Torsten, thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Torsten's given us five minutes only, so I shall reserve my stories about Stefan and the resurrection of the British banking system in 2009 to conversation over dinner. Um, I think it is impossible to understand the movement towards central bank independence without seeing it in the context of the great inflation of the 1970s, and also the stagflation of the 1980s. The former was the consequence of, I think in large part, an intellectual mistake at the time in thinking that there was a long-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment, so that tolerating a somewhat higher rate of inflation would make it possible to sustain a lower level of unemployment. But following the breakdown of Bretton Woods and the link to gold, and two large oil price shocks, discretionary monetary policy led to rates of inflation well into double digits, and in some cases, such as the UK, above 20%. And as Ken said, in many emerging markets, even higher still. And the stagnation, the stagflation of the 1980s was the painful consequence of efforts to reduce inflation, which led to recessions, while inflation still remained relatively high. Now, an intellectual revolution in macroeconomics undermined the belief in this long-run trade-off between inflation and employment and helped to restore the case for price stability, which had been made over many decades before, arguably most persuasively by Maynard Keynes in his tract of monetary reform. But the attempt to achieve it after the breakdown of Bretton Woods by rigid exchange rate links collapsed in 1992 with the departure from the exchange rate mechanism in Europe of both the UK and Italy and the end of the fixed exchange rate links in Sweden, where interest rates had been, some of us remember, hard to think of this now, raised to 500%. And the same applied to Finland. Now, politicians drew two conclusions from the unhappy experience of the 70s and 80s. First, inflation was unpopular. If exchange rates were to float, therefore, then a domestic framework was needed to ensure price stability. And that framework was the adoption of inflation targets. And second, the measures required to eliminate inflation were also deeply unpopular with high rates of unemployment for a while. So politicians found that setting interest rates wasn't actually much fun. So why not give that power to an independent central bank with a mandate set by parliament? And those two conclusions led governments around the world to give greater independence to their central banks. And in most cases, this did go hand in hand with an inflation target. <clears throat> 
Now, the policy debates at the time in the 1990s are, I think, helpful in understanding the challenges to monetary policy today. But there are three important differences between then and now. First, in the 1990s, the memory of the great inflation of the 1970s was still vivid. Today, there is almost no one below retirement age who remembers the peak inflation of almost 50 years ago. And until recently, low inflation had come to be taken for granted, both by economists who mistakenly assumed that inflation in the medium term was determined by the inflation target, and by the public who had stopped thinking and talking about inflation. So the constituency for low inflation, so widespread in the 1990s, has been somewhat eroded. Secondly, in the 1990s, the popular support for low inflation encouraged politicians to grant independence to central banks and to support them when it was necessary to raise interest rates. I think today governments can see only too clearly the challenge of issuing substantial quantities of government debt when interest rates are rising and central banks are no longer buying their debt. So external pressures on central banks are, I think, much greater now than in the simpler days of the 1990s. And third, when they were introduced, and I think this is in some ways the most important point, inflation targets were not seen as a theory of inflation. But today, in the models currently fashionable in academia and used by central banks, the inflation target is the variable that closes the model and determines the path of inflation in the medium term. But the original aim of inflation targets was actually to focus and change the way decisions on monetary policy were made. That is why inflation targets were accompanied by measures to increase the transparency and accountability of decisions and decision makers respectively. Clear explanations of the reasons for decisions on interest rates were to be set out not as a matter of mystique by central bankers mumbling and saying very little, they were set out clearly in speeches, evidence to parliaments, and reports such as the Bank of England's inflation report. And although these innovations remain, I worry that model builders have tried to use the inflation target as a theory of what drives inflation. Because as a result, any deviation of inflation from target is assumed to be transitory and policy mistakes followed. So I conclude really that an analysis of why many central banks were granted independence in the 1990s, along with the adoption of inflation targets, is clearly relevant to understanding today's challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thorsten. Thank you very much um, to the organizers. And I was very honored um, to be invited here to speak on this panel on the occasion of the farewell of Stefan Ingwis. Um, for me, when I joined the ESRB, the European Systemic Risk Board, um, he was one of the founding fathers. He was already there. And um, I actually learned a lot from him in terms of the relevance of um, financial stability for monetary policy the importance to need to act when it's needed, and the importance of clarity in communication. And I'm saying this not to break the rules, because actually um, rules are important, and that's going to be one of my main points here. But I'm saying this because I think this is all crucially important at the current juncture. As we've just heard, I think in some sense, central banks have enjoyed a capital of inattention or rational in inattention to risks to price and financial stability. We've lived in a period of um, very low inflation and, uh, and moderated risks to fin financial stability, so the public didn't actually pay much attention to central banks' core mandates. 
but current macroeconomic developments, not just cyclical, but also structural, really challenge price and financial stability. So explaining uh, central bank independence and acting accordingly has become um, more difficult and also more important. Central bank independence is certainly protected by um, institutional safeguards. We've just heard that. And that actually includes um, fiscal and macroprudential policy frameworks. But I think we also need to be very accountable. We need clear communication to sustain public support to independence. So let me um, explain these points um, quickly. Obviously, as been mentioned, um, inflation and risks to financial stability have been low, so the public in some sense could safely delegate uh, the task of price and financial stability to technocrats and central banks and pay relatively limited attention to the details. Now, this has changed. That's my second point. So, um, we have, first of all, inflation, which is uh, well above targets of central banks today, and it's one of the main concerns of the, of the general public. I looked at the rec most recent Euro bar barometer um, poll, and there, 42% of the respondents, and I think that's actually on the low side, um, side rising prices as the most important concern, and actually that ranks above issues like energy supply and the international situation. And I would argue that actually concern about high levels of prices and perceived inflation is going to remain even if and when inflation rates recede. So that's the first um, challenge. The second challenge is that um, during periods of um, low interest rates, vulnerabilities in the financial system have built up. In Germany, to give an example, we've had two decades of declining corporate insolvencies very low credit risk, strong support to the real economy and indirectly also to the financial system through fiscal and monetary policy. And that, we think, leads to an underestimation of macroeconomic risk um, going forward and also the expectation of further policy support. So higher vulnerabilities in the financial system is the second vulnerability. The third, we have high levels of debt, and that creates tensions between fiscal and monetary policy. And that's my third point. It's important, but also more difficult, to actually explain the role of central bank independence and to act accordingly. So one tension, one conflict of interest that can arise in the short term is there can, that there can be pressure on central banks to keep interest rates too long for, for longer to avoid risks to financial stability, but I think this even makes, um, increases vulnerabilities in the financial system. So if we delay the necessary monitor, monetary adjustment, that can lead to the buildup of further vulnerabilities. And I think if we look back to the global financial crisis, we have seen how monetary policy can actually come or be, be at risk to come under fiscal or financial dominance. So at the time of the crisis, central banks provided liquidity to stressed financial institutions and often to institutions with potential solvency problems. Capital buffers in the financial sector were insufficient and fiscal funds were ultimately needed to cover losses. What are the lessons from this episode? Well, we need sufficient capital buffers in the private sector. Gaps in the institutional framework needed to be closed, so resolution frameworks have been certainly high on the agenda. And independence and credibility of central bank also may come under threat if there are insufficient fiscal backstops. Now, a lot has happened in the meantime. Um, we have better fiscal and macroprudential frameworks, and that help us to prevent financial or uh, fiscal or financial dominance. And these frameworks are actually complementary to the frameworks for central bank independence that we've um, just heard about. Obviously, there's a lot of institutional safeguards to central bank independence, in Europe, primary law assigns a strong role to central bank independence and the legal basis in the euro system is even stronger than in, than in Germany. So changing the treaty would require unanimity versus simple majority when it comes to uh, changing the Bundesbank law in Germany. Maybe just as an interesting side, effect, uh, side remark, there's interesting historical research showing how independence was um, made into the, um, in, into the legislation in, in, in Germany. And when independence was discussed in the, in the 40s and 50s, there was actually stronger support for independence by the, by the US authorities than by the German authorities. 
Obviously, it's different when it comes to um, financial stability. Um, the frameworks, the macroprudential frameworks that we have, have to consider that the time horizon for financial stability risks is, is different than for monetary policy. Financial cycles last longer than business cycles. The policy objectives are different. It's more difficult even to quantify financial stability than this is the case for price stability. And we have different types of instruments. But still, we need also independence for financial stability policies, um, as we've also heard from um, to, to Tobias, to avoid an action bias and to avoid that we, um, authorities come under, under fiscal pressure. And the last point I would like to make is also something that um, uh, colleagues have mentioned. Legal frameworks are not sufficient. We have to communicate and to explain independence. And this can actually be quite a balancing act. So we have on the one hand the technical experts where, um, which, to which we have, have to explain our policy cycle, where we evaluate our policies, the intended and unintended consequence of policy choices. But these policy evalu evaluations are rather technical and tuned to an expert audience. But at the same time, we need to convince the general public that the central bank acts in its best interest and protects the public good stability. So we need a translation from the language spoken by the technocrats to the language spoken by the general public, but we don't have established dictionaries for that. So um, one tool that the Bundesbank is using is actually a small video. It's like a comic strip explaining why financial stability is not boring. And if you get the chance, take a look at it and give us, give us feedback. And so I think we, we need this dialogue with the public in particular because we live in a time of structural change and we need to understand what's going on around us and so we need a lot of communication channels also to the, to the general public. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here today. I guess I'd like to start by, by thanking you, Stefan, for your friendship, for being a great colleague. You are an absolutely essential person in our world, and you'll be, you'll be badly missed. Um, I'm going to uh, use my comments uh, focusing on the US context, and I'll address three main points. First, uh, the Federal Reserve's monetary policy independence is an important and broadly supported institutional arrangement that has served the American public well. Second, the Fed must continuously earn that independence by using our tools to achieve our assigned goals of maximum employment and price stability, and by providing transparency to facilitate understanding and effective oversight by the public and their elected representatives in Congress. Third, we should stick to our knitting and not wander off to pursue perceived social benefits that are not tightly linked to our statutory goals and authorities. So starting with the first point, uh, as, uh, as Ken and, and uh, others have pointed out, on the first point, the case for monetary policy independence lies in the benefits of insulating monetary policy decisions from short-term political considerations. Price stability is the bedrock of a healthy economy and provides the public with immeasurable benefits over time. But restoring price stability when inflation is high can require measures that are not popular in the short term as we raise interest rates to slow the economy. The absence of direct political control over our decisions allows us to take these necessary measures without considering short-term political factors. And I believe that the benefits of independent monetary policy in the United States and, and more broadly around the world are well understood and broadly accepted. However, in a well-functioning democracy, important public policy decisions should be made in almost all cases by the elected branches of government. Grants of independence to agencies like ours should be exceedingly rare, explicit, tightly circumscribed, and limited to those issues that clearly warrant protection from short-term political considerations. With independence comes the responsibility to provide the transparency that enables effective oversight, in our case by Congress, which in turn supports the Fed's democratic legitimacy. And at the Fed, we treat this as an active, uh, not a passive responsibility. Over the past several decades, we've steadily broadened our efforts to provide meaningful transparency about the basis for and the consequences of the decisions that we make in service to the American people. We are tightly focused 
on achieving our statutory mandate, and on providing useful and appropriate transparency. On the third point, it is essential that we stick to our statutory goals and authorities and that we resist the temptation to broaden our scope to address other important social issues of the day. Taking on new goals, however worthy, without a clear statutory mandate would undermine the case for our independence. In the, era, uh, in the area of bank regulation, uh, as Tobias mentioned, the Fed has a degree of independence, as do the other federal bank regulators. Independence in this area helps ensure that the public can be confident that our supervisory decisions are not influenced by political considerations. And today, some analysts ask whether incorporating into bank supervision the perceived risks associated with climate change is appropriate, wise, and consistent with our existing mandates. Addressing climate change seems likely to require policies that would have significant distributional and other effects on companies, on industries, on regions, and on nations. Decisions about policies to directly address climate change should be made by the elected branches of government and thus reflect the public's will as expressed through elections. At the same time, in my view, the Fed does have a narrow but important responsibilities regarding climate-related financial risks. These responsibilities are tightly linked to our responsibilities for bank supervision. The public reasonably expects supervisors to require that banks understand and can appropriately manage their material risks, including the financial risks of climate change. But without explicit congressional legislation, it would be inappropriate for us to use our monetary policy or supervisory tools, for example, to promote a greener economy or to achieve other climate-based goals. We are not, and we will not be, a climate policy maker. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you all four for these lucid uh, remarks. Um, now um, you'll have a chance to agree or disagree with anything the other panelists just said, or you can also get into one of our main questions that you didn't cover in your initial remarks, especially if you have views on desirable reforms of uh, uh, central bank independence and mandates. Mervyn? Well, I just want to say how strongly I agree with what Jay Powell just said about mandates. Uh, independence from politicians is a great responsibility, and it cannot be misused by trying to creep into areas which have not been explicitly delegated by the appropriate political process. And the way I think about it is, is this, that nobody would ever create a central bank to prevent pandemics. Nobody would ever create a central bank to combat climate change. They would create a central bank to try to ensure price stability, and they would create a central bank in order to try to maintain stability of the financial system. So I think if you're going to have central bank independence, you should always remember the maxim, which I think is crucial for any agency, which is only do what only you can do. And there are plenty of other people who can d take measures to combat climate change. And I worry that people, are in the great enthusiasm for doing good, are actually putting at risk central bank independence. Others? Ken? Well, uh, not necessarily to the three questions, but just mm -hmm. expanding slightly. Yeah, please. Uh, I think, uh, particularly when interest rates were hovering around zero, uh, one of the challenges to central bank independence was the idea, we don't need it for f uh, stabilization policy anymore. That's very popular among a significant group of academics. In fact, if you look at a poll of the American Economic Association and compare what they said in 2000, where that was not considered to be a good idea by most, the considerable majority did think it was a good idea by 2021. And uh, 
no one introduced Torsten, but he's made giant contributions in political economy along with his co-author Guido Tavellini, also Lars Svensson who's here, and the late Alberto Alessina. And this just seems to have been forgotten that uh, I will see, I'll pick on him, Paul Krugman, draw an IS and LLM curve. And he says, well, you could shift the IS curve, that's fiscal policy, or you could shift the LLM curve. You can kind of do one or the other. Well, I mean, fiscal policy is actually the sum of tens of thousands of different policies which are pol hardwired politically. And the idea, uh, fiscal policy is absolutely necessary in many cases. Uh, and of course, when a catastrophe, a pandemic, a financial crisis hits, it's, uh, it's, it's less political. <laughs> but in most cases, the independence of the central bank gives it this ability to approach things more technocratically uh, and fairly quickly that where fiscal policy needs time to sort out the political dimensions of things. Well, I, I mean, one uh, reflection that I have when I listen to the panel here and also looking at the questions how, how central bank independence has evolved over time, I think it's certainly important that we also see it as a generational issue. So to what extent does the young generation, I thought, it, I think that was very interesting what, what you said, like in the, in the 90s there was still the memory of higher inflation and I also alluded to the discussion of um, the, the situation in Germany in the, in the 50s where actually the politicians were seemed to be tempted when you read the account of the historians to have a little bit less indep uh, independent central banks but the public was still so much aware of the of the of the of the high inflation that they pushed for for uh, the, that the public opinion pushed towards more and more independence together with the with the U.S. authorities at the time, and I wonder whether to, today we are reaching the the younger pop population and explain to them why central bank independence is so important. Um, and I think that's also part of our, our outreach that we have to to do. Jay, so I'll admit to not really answering the third question. Um, so, but I, but I'll take a shot at it now if I can. Mm -hmm. um, so. I, uh, the question being, uh, did either the, the, the um, global financial crisis or the pandemic and the responses to them, does it, does it suggest that there are problems with the mandate, un unforeseen tensions between um, either you know, financial stability and monetary policy and that sort of thing? And I guess I would uh, take the position that that's, that would not be my takeaway at all. I think that um, I think what it happened in both crises is that central bankers used their tools pretty innovatively to deal with uh, exceptionally dish, uh, you know, unforeseen and difficult circumstances. I think the main takeaway from the uh, global financial crisis was the need to build a far more resilient core of the financial system. And um, we did that, the, the banks did that, we did that, all over the world people did that, and I think that financial system now is, is now substantially more resilient and more strong at its core. I think it held up better in, in the pandemic as a result. The pandemic was was a different thing. It was a you know it called for a whole of government response uh, from a medical standpoint, and it called for use of fiscal policy and monetary policy tools in unprecedented ways. Uh, you know there had been a concern in, in the United States that Dodd Frank had too limited the Fed's authority under Section 13.3 to do facilities and lending. The, the the new system actually worked quite well. What it, what it did was it required the Treasury's the elected part of the government's approval for these emergency lending facilities. And that actually worked very well. And that, that's actually a, an appropriate thing because these are extraordinary measures. We only have the authority during emergencies and to have the elected government approving it, it was a very constructive process between us and the Treasury. So I guess to take a step back, I, uh, I, I think that the tools that we, that we have work. I think there's nothing wrong with our mandates. We don't, I don't see any, anything about the laws that govern us or, or provide our mandates. Uh, that needs to be changed, and it, it seems to have worked pretty well in these two very difficult circumstances. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yet there is a, somehow, a, at least to, to some of us, a, a difference in the reaction in the in the 90s and the reactions now. So in the in the 90s, the public enemy number one had been inflation, as Mervyn and, and Ken had discussed, and you know that was an outcome of decision making that. It wasn't useful and was subject to these credibility problems. And we, what we tried to uh, do then was to construct a more robust framework in terms of institutional reform that would produce better decisions that would keep inflation low. 
Um, now, the public enemy number one, arguably over the next 25, 30 years, were, were these repeated financial crises or risks of financial crisis. And it's true that there was, uh, of course, much more regulation of the financial sector, but uh, not to the same extent, uh, you know, trying to address by institutional measures the, the, the underlying decisions uh, in, in this arena. Um, by banks, yes, but not by, not necessarily by policymakers. So, is there a case, Mervyn? You have strong thoughts on who should be responsible for financial stability and macroprudential uh, policies? Is, do do the events that we went through during those dramatic that dramatic era of the great financial crisis uh, made you rethink those uh, those issues? Well, I think the answer is yes, because when the Bank of England was made independent in 1997, actually both the then governor, Eddie George, and myself were quite content, despite some press speculation to the contrary, that bank regulation would go to a separate body. But the reason was that at that point, supervision of banks was really all about depositor protection, it was about elimination of insider trading, fraud, etc. It wasn't about his, a historical bank run and about inadequate prudential regulation. And in really in the five years before the financial crisis, that's when you saw the leverage of the banking system increase very rapidly so that it did become very fragile. And I think after that, you know, I was very struck that when the to be Prime Minister David Cameron and George Osborne, the Chancellor, came to see me. Their argument for putting it back, regulation back in the Bank of England, was essentially that the only institution that people will trust is the central bank. Therefore, you need to take some of this back. Now, you can argue, I think, whether some of the details of regulation needs to be inside or outside the central bank. That's a less important thing. But the principles of ensuring as Jay said, that the banking system was sound, uh, I think are ones that central banks have to be involved in. But deep down, it seems to me the big difference between the way policy was set in the, certainly the 80s and early 90s and today is this business of recognising that the quid pro quo of central bank independence is communication, explanation and clarity of that communication. The great American economist Bob Solo once said that an economist needs three qualities, faith, hope, and clarity. And the greatest of these is clarity. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Tor Torsten, can I yeah. just say something in response to your comment? I mean, inflation's back. So yes, if you'd asked that question in 2021, Maybe, you know, people said, well, financial crises, but I think you need a, a, a framework uh, that, as Jay was saying, is stable over the full cycle of yep. things that are happening and doesn't get, you know, it gets tuned. But, uh, and also, let's look at the rest of the world, please. Uh, I think if we're looking at developing economies, emerging markets, which are also struggling to find frameworks that uh, I wouldn't tell the IMF to change what it's doing in terms of central bank independence. All right, so maybe we'll go to the section when the public is involved, the Q&A session. So um, if you want to say something, please raise your hand. Uh, if you want to pose a question, if you do get the mic, Please start by saying your name, please be succinct, and please try to relate to the overall theme of the, <laughs> of the panel. <laughs> okay, Richard Portis, please. Yeah, we're coming through. Richard Portis, London Business School and European Systemic Risk Board, where I have learned over several years a great deal from Stefan English. Uh, no more of that now, but maybe later. Um, I'm not totally convinced that we now have a resilient system. Uh, Mark Carney said that in 2017 uh, as his final statement uh, from the Financial Stability Board. 
Uh, but then the banks, yes. But we found in uh, early 2020 that that wasn't true of the non-banks, uh, in particular the money market funds, and the central banks had to step in. Central banks don't like to do that, quite rightly. They don't like to have to act as market makers of last resort. Uh, and that may be a compromise of the mandate. So the questions that I would put to the panel, I mean, as we've seen, nominal, as we've seen very recently, the rise in nominal rates is exposing financial fragilities in the system. They came from the search for yield, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and we saw an extreme example of that in the United Kingdom in September uh, of this past year. Uh, now, in those circumstances, um, uh, should financial stability be explicitly in the mandate? Should we be recognizing reality, what central banks actually do in practice? Would that help avoid financial dominance? Uh, if it were in the mandate. Given the huge costs of financial crises, uh, is financial dominance in a sense inevitable, recognize, recognize reality, um, and put financial stability in the mandate? Why not? Who wants to take well, a stab on that? I mean, in a sense, it is in the mandate, mm -hmm. uh, most central banks now. And I think it needs to be linked explicitly to the instruments of central banks. This was the problem before. And the obvious instrument is, whether you call it lender of last resort to banks or the equivalent to the non-bank sector. And I think that the central banking community is very focused on the question of defining the circumstances and the nature of institutions that happen to be non-banks that would merit an intervention. And I think that the only way to handle this is to have a framework which is set out ex ante, which actually tries to identify clearly the circumstances and the institutions that would merit uh, lending from the central bank, but also ensures that the scale of that intervention is also under the control of the central bank and not something which the actors themselves in the financial system can expand to almost any number simply by the actions that they take. It's ensuring that there is enough collateral against which to lend by the central bank. Now, I think the central banking community is well aware of these problems. It doesn't make them easy. It doesn't mean that you can do it in a week. But my guess is, yes, you're right, Richard, that there will be an expansion of the mandate and that it's there in principle, but it needs to be made much more concrete by saying, what are the institutions, what are the circumstances, whether it's maturity mismatch or something else that would justify an intervention and to have sufficient regulation on that degree of maturity mismatch ex ante to limit the size of the intervention. Claudia. Yeah, no, I, I agree that, that um, to some extent the, the framework for central banks to be involved in, in macro policy is well defined. So the, the Bundesbank, according to the German financial stability law, has a clear mandate in that regard. Um, it's, it's a joint mandate with the supervisory authority and with the Ministry of Finance because, as we all know, there's a lot of distributional implications that macroprudential policy decisions can, can have. So it's not us alone. And I think also the ECB has clarified in its strategy review how monetary policy and financial stability interact. Um, so um, the, the, the one point that I would like to make in, in addition is that um, we, we also do have frameworks for evaluation of policies and whether we've done enough. So the, the FSB, the Financial Stability Board, started this big, big project in 2017 and looked at the reforms that have been implemented, found, found no major side effects, found that a lot has been achieved, but there are still also gaps when it comes to resolution reforms. So I think also for the, the areas that you mentioned, the non-bank financial inter intermediation space, we clearly have to implement policies and, and, and look at the resilience in, in that part. So I, I fully agree. We can never say that the job is done and we can all lay back. That's what we are there for. Here Jay, for. Jay, please. Just to add, in, in the same spirit, I think that the, what the pandemic r revealed was weaknesses in the, in the non-bank financial sector, much as the global financial crisis revealed those weaknesses in the, in the, in the big banks and the, in the lar large uh, utilities, financial market utilities. And so there has been, as, as Claudio was saying, there's, and, uh, and Mervyn was saying, 
there's a lot of effort going into and has been in, in what do you do about money market funds? What do you do about the Treasury market? These things are much – and I think the first-order answers need to be changes to the structure to, of these in, institutions to make them stronger and more resilient on their own. Um, I would say expanding the, the provision of central bank liquidity is, is, is not, the, not the desired – Response: It really is to strengthen these institutions. Our capital markets are quite vibrant and very different from, in what they do from, uh, uh, you know, from what the banks do. And I, I would, I wouldn't want to see the kind of prudential regulation that goes along with, uh, with, with liquidity provision. I, I don't think it would be, it wouldn't be great to extend that too much into the into the non-bank financial sector. I'd rather work on structural reforms, which is which is kind of what we've been doing. Klaus Eklund. Thank you, uh, Torsten. You mentioned that you made did graduate students to, uh, graduate studies together with uh, with Stefan. I can add that I actually made undergraduate stu studies together with Stefan, so I'm even older. But a question of independence. Uh, it seems that you have mainly been discussing central bank independence from, let's call it, political pressure, and of course, by par partisan pressure would be even worse. But there's something more subtle about the independence issue, which I think we can discuss in Sweden right now. Um, I'm personally interested in that. I worked in the finance ministry many years ago, but I was also on the general board of the Riksbank, Riksbanks Helmekti, not the board of directors, but the general board before, in the old evil days before independence. Anyway, in Sweden we have four institutions. The Riksbank, uh, the Financial Supervisory Authority, uh, the debt office, and of course the Minister of Finance. And they often work with similar issues, obviously. And they often have to cooperate. So the question here is how independent can the central bank be in reality? To what extent must the central bank discuss, compromise, lean against the wind or with the wind, and be politically agile at the same time as it is formally independent? Maybe it sounds like a stupid question, but I think actually this is almost as important as the, let's call it the big issue of political independence. I'm, I, I'd like to hear sort of your experiences from this. How independent can the central bank really be? Well, uh, can I start by saying, I think we have to distinguish between monetary policy independence, where the case I think is very strong from all the other activities of the central bank. So as a regulator, uh, uh, the United States, Fed's very powerful, but there are many other regulators it deals with. And uh, this, I think you're, the same is true in most countries. So that it, it's, it's very different conceptually. And I think all regulators, we'd like to be independent from over political influence and being bought off or, you know, uh, even if it's only psychically held hostage by those that it regulates. But I think that's, uh, if you, the central bank in general and looking at all its functions, it clearly has to coordinate with other agencies. It clearly has to be uh, subordinate to political uh, policy as we had in the first session here. So I can speak from, from my experience, which was that between 1997 when the Bank of England was made independent and 2013 when I left, there wasn't a single episode where the elected politicians put pressure on the bank to adopt one interest rate policy or change rather than any other. Whereas, as Jay talked about, the uh, facilities that were put in place in the US under the new regime, which you know, was meant in some sense to give more control to elected politicians, we in the Bank of England um, in 2010 really introduced a compact between the Treasury uh, and the Chancellor on the one hand and the Bank of England on the other, which said that any lender of last resort operation had to be approved by the Treasury. That seems to me perfectly reasonable and appropriate. And you have a private conversation where you explain why you want to do it. and. In very few cases could I imagine that the Treasury would say, if the central bank feels that a lender of last resort operation is appropriate to prevent some collapse, the idea that the Treasury is going to say you can't do it, I think is not likely to be, to be true. But since taxpayers' money is at risk, 
it's perfectly reasonable for the Treasury to have an input on it. There was never any conflict between these two different approaches in the different areas of policy. So I think the important thing is for it to be quite clear what that policy responsibility is, whether it's in the US with changes in legislation or the compact agreed between the bank and the Treasury in the UK. It's quite clear what the lines of responsibility are and who has to be consulted. That's the important thing. That's what prevents, I think, things going very wrong. It's where the same, it's where different institutions or players all feel that they are the p people responsible for a particular policy that you get difficulties. Yeah, well, to express it differently and perhaps more simply, you know, it's a big difference between uh, taking the decision in deliberation with others or taking it after deliberation with others. Yeah. Uh, and that's the responsibility yeah. point, right? So, yes, please. Thank you very much for the panel, Joachim Nagel for the Bundesbank. Let me put it like this. I think it was already said by Ken Rockoff. I think inflation is back now. We are more or less, in my interpretation, still in the midst of a storm, and the storm is not over. So we have to do our job, our main mandate. This is our role. During the last 10, 12 years, we were the most welcome partners of the politicians because we, in our independent role, we did everything to fought against all the financial crisis and did what we did. But this came with a price. And now in the next years, the politicians have to learn that monetary policy is coming with a price. So maybe some of us, they have to announce that there are maybe losses or not the profits we came up in the past. What is your opinion about that? Is that influencing the way we, will, we are being perceived in the future about our independency? Who wants to take that on? Well, I'm, I'll take it on. It's related to something that I said, which is that the pressures from politicians will be greater and more complex today than they were in the 1990s. And you're absolutely right. But I don't think it's an issue about the mandate of the central bank. That is unchanged. It's that some people in positions of political responsibility will learn that life can be difficult. But I don't really see that there is a great wish anywhere to change the formal independence of central banks. But politicians will always want other people to do things that would benefit their own short-run interests. That's where central banks will remain solid and maintain their independence in respect of monetary policy. And they have every incentive to do so, in my view. Someone else? No? Well, I, I, I'll add briefly. I, I mean, clearly, uh, there are many cases where, given the central bank's independence, Politicians will look to the central bank, as we've been saying, to do something they should do, but they don't want to do, or uh, political interests uh, will say want something to do with inequality or something to do with the environment that they're not getting through uh, the political system, and they'll view the central bank perhaps as an end around uh, being able to implement it. But of course, you know, at the end of the day, the central bank can't take political decisions consistently and maintain its independence. Uh, there, there are deep crises where the central bank just has to act. But I think in that case, it, you know, it again is looking to the political system to back it up. If you go to developing economies, the normal you know, rhythm of things is the central bank moves, but then the uh, Treasury kind of takes over everything it did, and everybody knows that that's coming, and so you know it works that way because the central bank can move so quickly. But um, you know it it uh, needs to be very wary of uh, taking political decisions. Stefan, outside the outside the topic of the panel, but since Ken, you are on the on the panel, I'll ask you anyway. Uh, you wrote a a nice little book called The Curse of Cash. And in this environment, cash is disappearing. So what's your advice? Well, isn't it wonderful that the people who organized this 
uh, event had a panel just before us about this. But uh, no, I think uh, one of the things that's been very naive about uh, the, I will call them crypto evangelists, is that they can somehow do something better and have an end around. And in fact, if you look at the history of money, which is probably what I should have called my book, um, and you, you look, look at uh, the private sector always invents everything, exactly. but for many reasons, the governments uh, eventually regulate it and even sometimes appropriate it. And I think, you know, the, that, that's what we're seeing uh, uh, going forward in the digital space. You need rules of the road. And I, I was going to bring it up earlier, but I, I mean, have to mention FTX. Uh, that was kind of a success for the regulatory community. It, it didn't do anything. It's yes. the $32 billion at the heart of the crypto system just had, 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 uh, had no effect. And I, I think it, you know, it shows how you, you need, but you need some regulatory structure to provide guardrails and uh, the central banks need to do that. But anyway, I've learned from you over the years on this issue. So thank you for asking that question. <laughs> Oh, since we're spiraling out of control here with questions about <laughs> anything, we, we should uh, try to wrap up. So all good things must come to an end, and I'm not going to try to uh, to summarize uh, what is what has been said. Uh, but we, I'd like to end with uh, some final remarks. Um, uh, but really, just one minute for each of you to summarize for the audience, which is the most important thing that we should take away from the panel, if you had to expound on one, which would that be? Uh, who wants to take that first? Jay? So I, I'll just conclude by saying that um, for us, central bank independence is a matter of statute. It's not in our constitution. It's just an institutional r arrangement that, that has served the public well, nothing more, nothing less. And as long as it does serve the public well over time, then I, I think it's safe, and I think it's safe now. But that means we've got to be committed to, to achieving our goals and to sticking to this precious grant of independence to, to keep it. We need to deserve it, and that means stick to that work and don't, don't look for broader things. Where it was discussed at the first panel, really, we, we shouldn't be getting ahead of where the public is um, if there's no specific mandate. Uh, and in, in the case of the U.S., that's a particularly salient point today. Claudia, yeah, no, it's your I, bottom line. I, I fully agree with what um, Jay just said, and and that's also again when you look at the German history. So sticking to the to, to the mandate and deliver. I mean, this is what's what's building trust. And I think when it comes to financial stability, we actually at a at a critical juncture because the system has not been fully tested. So we have to make sure that we also deliver on on both of our our mandates, price and and financial stability. Marvin. All good things do not have to come to an end. <laughs> and central bank independence is one of them. And I think the point that comes up, for me comes out of all this is you can have a debate about whether interest rates should go up and if so by how much or go down a bit. That's to do with the actual decision that's being made in a moment. But institutional arrangements matter. They really matter. And that's why central bank independence, I suspect, will live longer than many good ideas. I also believe central bank independence will go on for many decades to come. It's you know, hard to know uh, forever. And I, I, I would just again argue, as I said in my remarks, that it's really been maybe the most uh, successful policy innovation post-World War II uh, and uh, continues to be. Okay. Let's stop at that and take early coffee. Thank you with a big applause to the panel. Thank you. Okay.